Well, it's been it's great to be with you this morning. This morning on this on this wonderful Sunday to celebrate uh, worship and fellowship together. It's great to be gathered around the, the Word of God as all as always, because His Word is truth, and we seek Him. But just before we read the passage, we're going to be asking God for wisdom from. Let us just pray together. Lord, we want to thank you that. We are here in your presence. We want to thank you that your word is true. Your word is living. Your word is active. I want to thank you that your word has something for us as individuals, but for us collectively as your church. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that as we turn to your living word, that you would again draw our attention to the truth that you would want us to hear. You would, you would take it and you plant it deep in our hearts to transform us. So we just want to thank you. Uh, and ask that you will speak for we're listening. Amen. Well, I just want us to turn, um, if, if you have your Bibles, we want to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Um, I believe you've been doing the series in t- titled, How We Are Complete in Christ. It's a very important topic as Christians. Um, to know how we are to be complete and continue in our daily discipleship. But this passage, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, which we will be looking at, we're going to be probably dealing with one of the well-known verses, one of the popularly well-known verses, or one that's quoted in the name of Christ. So we're going to just read together Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. I'm reading from the NIV, and it says this, Therefore... As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe clothe, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you have or you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love that binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I think this is very important, um, and I must must bring a bit of a confession. I was always told you should never start a sermon with a confession, but I will start with a confession here, that when I was given this passage to prepare... um, I, f- I have found it very difficult. I've been going through some issues myself. And this passage has spoken to me um, deeply, and I hope it speaks to you. Within this passage, we, uh, we have one of the uh, misused or misquoted verses um, well, we find throughout Scripture that Christians are great, are very good to do. In fact, the verse itself is never quoted, but just part of the verse. Uh, and it's normally taken out of context as most of these things are. In verse 17, it says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through, through him. In fact, norm, and normally the quote will go, um, and perhaps you've heard it, it goes something like this, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That is good, and it's a nice, it's a nice summary, it's a nice sort of synopsis of the verse, but that's not what the verse says. Um, and we are very good at trying to apply, imply that um, along our own personal um, life or a justification for doing something we want to do rather than what God wants us to do. As long as we're doing it for the glory of God, then we're all good. Um, and I think we have to be careful in how we apply these verses. And I think context is very, very important. As always, if you take a text out of its context, you've got a pretext. And I think we have to understand, we have to keep it right within its context to get a full understanding of what God is saying. Within this passage from, from the verses 12 to 17, we, we have six instructions for the Christian. Not only six instructions for the Christian, but we've got six instructions for the body of Christ as well. Because the body of Christ is made, made up of individual parts. 
of born-again believers. And I think these six instructions, while applying to each and every one of us individually, applies to us collectively as church, as the body of Christ. The context of this text is part of what is entitled Rules for Holy Living. So if you want to know what it is to live a holy life, if you want to know what it is to live a life that reflects Christ in your daily life, be it at work, be it um, in school, if we're still going there these days because of lockdown, but what, look, even within our family life, and sometimes the hardest place to be a Christian is in, is in your family because your family members know you too well and they know which buttons to push. But if we want to have a holy life, if we want to demonstrate a holy life and, and follow Christ in a holy life, then this passage is one of the key passages. And within its context, it's all about how we as individual Christians and we collectively as a church live a holy life. Now, I will clarify this for a moment. What I'm not saying is that you're better than the person next to you and you're not better than your work colleague or your school friend. You're not better than any other person. What I am saying is God has saved you from your sin. He saved you from hell. He's brought you into his kingdom. He's adopted you into his family. And in Christ, and in Christ alone, you are holy. And we will look at this momentarily when he talks about us being a holy people. But verse 12 starts with a wonderful, ver, a wonderful word. Verse 12 starts with that word, therefore. And I've always, I was always taught and I've always said, and people who hear me speak on this will know, are probably sick of me saying it. When you, when you see that word, therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. And I think it's very important as well that we understand that within chapter one, we talk about the supremacy of Christ, that Christ is above all. Christ is the only true God. Christ is the light of the world. And through that light, you, he brought form out of formlessness. He brought light, he shone light into darkness and he took what was empty or void and he filled it. And so we see the supremacy of Christ being presented right from the very beginning to hear when Paul is talking to Col the, the people in Colossae, the church in Colossae, and saying that Christ should be raised above all things. And that challenge is for us that Christ is to be first and foremost in our life. He is to be supreme. He alone is God. He alone is Savior. N -n no one else. And so he, we, we see chapter 1 talks about the supremacy of Christ. Chapter 2 talks about the freedom we have in Christ. That because of his death and his resurrection, because we have repented of our sins, we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. We're washed by His shed blood, as it were, as those phrases go, that we are set free because we have repented of our sins and we've turned away from our past life, our past way of living, and we follow Christ in our new path. That's what repentance actually means, is to turn around 180 degrees and walk in the opposite direction. And so now we follow Christ, we follow his way of living, his standards, his rules, his premises. We are free in Christ to live as he wants us to live, true f freedom in Christ. Chapter 3 then, as I said, talks about holy living. How do we live out the lordship of Jesus and the freedom we have in him? And I do want us to think about that. How do we live out the lordship of Jesus? It's not just about I'm saved by grace and there, uh, the, therefore I'm no longer under the law. It's not just a case of, you know, I am um, I'm saved and therefore I will do what I want and I've got my ticket to heaven. But this passage actually will imply that in context, because of the supremacy of Christ, that he alone is God, because we are free in Christ and in Christ alone, there are standards and rules by which we must live in order to reveal the lordship of Christ. It's not we play by our own rules, but we have to live by God's rules to reveal how he is Lord of our life. And I think it's very important because as we will see as we go through, whatever you do as an individual and whatever you do collectively as a church reflects on God, reflects on the Lord. You never get anybody, if we do something wrong, will turn around and go, oh, look at that person. If I do something wrong, they're not going to go, look at Rodney. Rodney's like this. They'll, they'll often say, but you Christians... And I think it's very important that we understand that whatever we do individually, 
or we do collectively reflects on Christ. And therefore, it's important to understand how we can live a holy life. Verse 12 continues and it says, as God's people, what is going, on, what is going to follow is for the church, the, the called out ones, for Christians. So here Paul is not saying this is for non-Christians. This isn't for the unsaved. This isn't for the, the person who hasn't given their life to the Lord. This is for us, God's chosen people, God's, God's church. So if you're here this morning or you're watching this this morning and you're thinking, you know what, I, I can't say I'm a Christian. I want you to listen. I want you to take in what has been said from the word of God. But this is specifically for Christians and how we should be li living a holy life. This is a standard put on us as Christians, as God's cho 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 chosen pe people. I love Paul's wording here. God has chosen us as his people. It brings back the whole concept of Israel uh, and God's chosen people. They were called out of the nations. The church was called out of its community to be a separate people, to live by a separate ruling so that when we live in the world, we reveal Christ in the world. So we are called out people to live by different standards, to live by different rules and, uh, and, uh, and a hell to a higher calling that we reveal God, we reveal Christ as God in all that we do and say. We are holy in Christ. I never claim to be holy in myself. I know me too well. And if any of you ask any of my family, they will also point and they'll say they know me too. Too well. I've got many flaws, but I stand before God holy because I am in, in Christ. That wonderful little phrase, in Christ. I am holy in Christ. When God the Father looks at me, he looks through the blood of Christ and he sees me holy. When he, when he looks at me, he looks through the resurrected Christ and he sees me holy because I've given my life over to him. I've made him Lord of my life. We're dearly loved by the Father demonstrated in Christ. Part of the gospel is, um, and I think a lost part of the gospel is, that we are saved from the wrath of God. The wrath of God isn't preached very often these, these days. And I honestly believe we have to get back to it. That on the cross, the wrath of God against sin was demonstrated. God hates sin. He abhors sin. Sin is what's going to take people to hell. And yet we see the anger of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God on the cross. But what we also see alongside that is God's love demonstrated in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So yes, while we are dearly loved, we are loved because God doesn't condemn us, John 3.17. We all know John 3.16. We can quote that in multiple translations, but we don't often know John 3.17, that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but they may be, that the world may be saved through him. He didn't come to condemn us because we were condemned already in our sins. He came to love us, and, and through him we may be saved. And therefore, verse 12 says, therefore, because we're free in Christ, therefore, because he is Lord of our life, we are holy in Christ and we are dearly loved by God. I want you to grab hold of that, that you today, I don't know what's going on in your mind. I don't know what's going on in your heart. I don't know if you're having a great day, bad day, you're having negative thoughts, whatever, but I want you to stop for a moment and I want you to just ponder on this. As Christians, we are holy in Christ. We stand holy in Christ. We are loved in Christ. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. But God loves you way too much to let you stay as you are. He wants you to be transformed from day to day. That's what, we, that's what we call discipleship, or that great word, sanctification. We, we need to be changed on a daily basis. That's why scripture says, in Christ we are holy, but we are being made holy. We stand holy before a holy God. Our sins are washed away, but we are being made holy. Every day we make the right choice. We're learning to make the right choice, to put God first above ourselves. So instruction one, that was just the introduction to instruction one. You'll be glad to know. 
is that we are to clothe ourselves. This is instruction one from verse 12. Um, we are to, we, we have to take off the old self, put on the new self. We are to be dressed in. And I love this when I was looking at this. Paul says, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Uh, and I know that sums up you all. I'm sure you can look at yourselves and go, you know, that, that's just me. Paul's talking about me. He had a picture of me in his mind when he was talking about all those things. Because I'm just the picture of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and, pa and patience. Perhaps not. I believe, and it's one of the great things for me, is as, as I was doing this, Paul will put up a high standard. Really, if you look at it, all of them, and I've had a great, I had a bit of a hunt around here. All of them, bar one, is reflected in the fruit of the Spirit. If you look at Galatians 5, verses 23 to 20, uh, uh, 22 to 23, and verse 26, even all of those that we've just read in Colossians can fit in the fruit of the Spirit. And I think it's very important that while they may be different wording, they mean, they mean the same. The fruit of the Spirit, for example, rather than saying humility, it says don't be conceited, don't be proud. Be humble. We had to put on humility. And so I, what I'm saying, saying, seeing here is Paul saying to the church at Colossae, he, and I believe what Paul is saying to us and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us is this, as God's holy people, put on God's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to demonstrate Christ and how l l loving he is, put on love. If you want to show how humble Christ is, then you have to put on humility and reveal Christ to those around you. Compassion and gentleness and patience. We all know the old story. Someone once prayed, Lord, give me patience and give, give me it now. Um, that's a, it's a prayer request I don't often ask for because patience is a difficult thing to learn. I'm still trying to learn that one. But we're told here, as God's holy people, as, ch as children of God, as the church, as individual Christians, to put on the fruit of the Spirit. My instruction to you is this morning, the, the instruction number one is this, clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves. Take off the old self. Every day, strive to take off the old self and put the new on make that conscious decision to live as Christ wants us to live make that conscious effort to constantly put God first and I know I'm asking something difficult I know it because it's difficult for me I will not admit if truth be told if truth be told I I've been listening to a song by Matthew West it's been absolutely brilliant called truth be told and I honestly believe that if we as Christians were so tr truthful about the struggles we have if we were really truthful about how we struggle, but how God is victorious and how our strength is found in Christ, each church, each pew would be full. Each church would be bursting at the seams. It's because we put this false picture that we're perfect, that we have no problems, that the church looks and goes, well, I don't believe it. You're a bit of a hypocrite. And rightly so. I struggle. But every day I make the choice, do I put Christ first? Do I put on the new self? Do I put on the fruit of the spirit? Do I put on this gentleness and patience and humility and kindness and compassion? Does it, does it season my words? Does it shape my actions? How is it impacting me? It's easy to say, but how is it impacting me and how I speak and treat my family, treat my kids, treat the person next to me, treat my next door neighbor. How does it in? How does it season how I do these things? It goes on to say, so as God's holy people, we are to clothe ourselves in the fruit of the Spirit. That's the instruction number one. Verse thirteen brings us to instruction number two: bear with each other. Bear with each other. I've often thought that this should be part of the wedding vows: bear with each other. Um, uh, it is part of life. Our day and age is too fickle. If it doesn't go our way, we drop it and we run for the hills. We change tax so very easily. We're not committed. There's not that covenant, that commitment as much as it should. And, and yet here, we're asked for a covenant relationship. As the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, we are, we are to commit ourselves to each other as the body. 
and to our, and to our head, who is Christ. We are to bear with one another. Bear with each other. That's instruction number two. We are imperfect, fallen people. As good as we think we are, we are living in a fallen world. And therefore, we need to bear with each other. Now, I will clarify what I've just said. I was a sinner, was a sinner, saved by grace. I'm, not a, I'm now a saint. I'm now holy in Christ. I've got a brand new identity. I'm a child of the living God. But I'm also a saint that will occasionally sin. And I think that's the reality. I'm not a sinner who is saved by grace. I'm a saint who will now occasionally okay, okay, Occasionally sin. Back when I was, just before I was 16, I became a Christian. That's when I was a sinner saved by grace. I was in my sin. I was born in my sin. And God saved me. But now, all these years on, as my hair is now wonderfully gray, I still look back and I go, you know what? I still struggle. And I am a sinner who will, I'm a saint who will occasionally sin. And that's why we need to bear with one another. That's why putting on the fruit of the Spirit is so vitally important because we're still in that process of discipleship, sanctification. And that is why it's so important. Forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. This is hard because when we are wronged, we want justice. But when we wrong someone, we, we want mercy. I think that's a human nature, that's a human thing. And I, I, I will confess at this point I'm wrestling with this over a, n- a number of things. But it doesn't matter what I feel in one sense. It doesn't matter how, un- how uncomfortable it is for me at the moment. With the body of Christ, with my believers, with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I am to forgive whatever grievance I may have against one, any one person because if there is division in the church we do not reveal Christ properly if there's grievance in the church it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong I'm not taking sides on who's right or who's wrong if there's division in the church we show a divided kingdom and a king, kingdom that's divided against itself won't stand a body <laughs> I mean there, I, I often joke with people um, that a Getting out of bed, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes it's really hard, uh, and I'm sure you'll admit it. But if I was getting out of bed and my right leg wanted to stay in bed, I wouldn't get very far. You know what I mean? The whole body has to get out, or the whole body has to stay in. We we cannot be divided. We can't be divided and still call ourselves a body. We need to forgive one another. Why? And Paul is very clear here. Why should we bear with, bear with each other? Why should we forgive each other? Because the Lord forgave gave us. I want you to think of the sin in your life. I want you to think about what God has forgiven you for and what, continues to, and what he f- continues to forgive you, forgive you for. Because if you're anything like me, you're still battling with habits, old habits. We know the phrase that old habits die hard. You know, and we still wrestle with them and we may, we may have victory over them and then we may fall for a bit and God forgives us. At no time does God reject us. He welcomes us and he forgives us. And I think it's very important that we understand that Paul puts the reason for us forgiving and bearing with one another is because God forgave us. Now, I'm not sure, I, don't, I don't want us to just take Paul's word for it. I want you to take... Christ's word for it. Christ himself taught us in Matthew 6, 12, as part of the disciples' prayer. We know it as the Lord's prayer, but it's the disciples' prayer as saying, forgive us our debts as we also forgive those (coughs) who are our debtors. Matthew 6, 14 goes on to say, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. The reality is, on our daily life as Christians, and as I said, this is for us as Christians, on our daily walk, our daily life, that daily forgiveness that we walk in and should be giving to others, because we're imperfect beings, still trying to learn and become more like Christ. And we are to forgive because Christ forgave us. And if we forgive each other, 
you will naturally bear with each other. Bearing, we also need a bit of patience. That's why I got in there, put on patience. We need, we need a bit of humility. You know, we need to you know, be willing to be a bit humble and, and have compassion with one another. Oh, I mentioned another one that's there to put stuff on. And you see how it all now begins to fit together. together. The Holy Spirit is there because we need the fruit of the Spirit to be able to do what God is asking us to do. To do what he has done for us. To forgive because he forgave us.